All right, thank you, and thanks for inviting me. So um, most of you know something about the neural nets, and um, Bruno um, Olshausen talked about the perceptron and the history of neural nets. This, and Frank Rosenblatt uh, invented the, the perceptron, and the, you may not know that the perceptron was actually a hardware, it wasn't software. It, and here's a picture of one of the machines he built and was kind of all of the connections between the different simulated neurons and so on. And people back then were quite excited about this. And in fact, the New York Times reported that the Navy revealed the embryo of an electronic computer today, so it was funded by the Navy, that it expects will be able to walk, talk, see, write, reproduce itself, and be conscious of its existence. <laughs> 1958. So, you know, AI, the hype machine and AI started long ago. Um, there was a lot of optimism in the 1960s. Uh, Claude Shannon himself expected that 10 or 15 years, you'd see something like the robots of science fiction. And uh, we saw from uh, Paul Safos also had this uh, quote from Herbert Simon, said that machines will be capable in 20 years of doing any work that a man can do. Uh, Marvin Minsky, uh, who went on to found the MIT AI lab, predicted that within a generation, which is maybe 25 years, uh, the problem of creating artificial intelligence will be substantially solved. So none of those, thing, none of those predictions really came, came about, but that doesn't necessarily stop people from still making predictions like this. So Shane Legg, uh, a couple years ago, who, the co-founder of Google DeepMind, is predicting human-level AI in the 2020s. And I think everybody here is familiar with Ray Kurzweil, who has long predicted uh, the singularity as being in 2045, where non-biological intelligence will be one billion times more powerful than all human intelligence today. Wow. OK. So other people are a little more skeptical. Mitchell Kapoor, uh, the founder of uh, Lotus um, and the Electronic Frontier Foundation, counters the, those um, predictors by saying that human intelligence is a little more subtle than we might have thought. Um, there's no danger of duplicating it anytime soon. Uh, he, have, in fact, has a, a bet going on with Ray Kurzweil whether or not a, a machine will pass a very strict Turing test in, by 2029. 20, uh, and um, I think it's like $20,000 will be given to some charity, depending on who wins. Gary Marcus is even more uh, strong in his criticism. He says, in the quest to create human-level AI, there has been almost no progress. So there's a lot of disagreement in the AI community itself about where we stand and how much, how close we are to human-level AI, or even if we're on the right path. So this led me to start thinking a little bit harder than I ever had before about what human level AI might even mean and what's needed. And even if we don't talk about human level AI, we certainly have lots of uh, machines that are uh, deployed in the real world and we'd like them to be reliable and trustworthy. And so what, what's actually needed for those um, machines to work the way that we want them to? So I'm gonna talk a little bit about sort of state of the art AI, uh, of AI in several areas. This, a lot of people are already familiar with some of this. Then I'll uh, address some of what have emerged as weaknesses and vulnerability of these approaches. And I'll claim that these are related to their lack of understanding in the sense that we humans mean understanding, their inability to extract the kinds of meanings that we want them to extract from their data. But then that raises the question, what, what the heck is understanding? What the heck is meaning? And I'll try and s say a few words. I don't have the answer necessarily, but I'll try and say a few words about what I think might be um, important to it. So state of the art. Most of you have seen uh, ConvNets uh, in several of slides in, in, during the last few days. Um, this is a particular ConvNet in which we have lots of different layers at which, um, I don't know if you can see over, over here, 
the goal is to classify an image as one of many different categories and the numbers following the words here are the confidence of the network. Okay, so this becomes a probability distribution over categories. And all knowledge here is learned from examples or in some cases the network has experiences where it's playing games or for whatever and is encoded as weights. So that's what knowledge is in, in a deep neural network. Um, and they work surprisingly well in a lot of um, domains. So Google Photos is an app that you can use to store your photos in the cloud and you can search your photos even if you don't label them. So Google will, will search them by content. So I s tried this, I have some photos up there and I tried searching fountain and I didn't label any of my photos as fountain, you know, in the text. And indeed it found um, a fountain in my, my, the one fountain in my Im images, this is a, a really beautiful fountain in downtown Portland. Um, and it was really, I was just blown away by this. And in fact, John Giandrea, who used to be um, a senior VP at Google, described this as it's actually understanding what's in the picture. So I put understanding in red because I want to sort of focus on like, what does he mean exactly? Um, and we know that um, self-driving cars, for example, use computer vision systems that are really good at tracking, uh, detecting and tracking objects like cars and trucks. Um, and in fact, on the most famous uh, challenge, challenge data set for object recognition called ImageNet, you can see the error rate of the winning systems go down and down and down over the years. This is supposedly the human performance, the human error rate. This actually is, is exactly one human who is, who, is one of the, who is a neural net researcher who just tried it on himself and that's what he got. So I, I would take that with a grain of salt. But anyway, it's really Im impressive. And in fact, this very, um, this uh, very, uh, steep drop here, oops, this very, come back, this very steep drop was um, where it says supervision um, was the um, first time a deep neural network was used in this competition. Okay, uh, probably you've seen some of the results on image captioning where we use, um, a, a, an image is fed into a convolutional network and instead of classifying the image, um, the activations of the top layer are then fed to um, a language processing uh, network, which I'm showing over several time steps, and it translates the um, image to a caption. So here, a cup of coffee on a table. And this has been trained on mi millions of image, images and captions that are written by humans on pairs. So um, it's learned from millions of examples to map the weights in a convolutional network from an image to a phrase. And the results are, can be very impressive. So like here, this was uh, an image that hadn't been trained on and yet it was able to describe it uh, similarly. Um, a herd of elephants walking across a dry grass field. This made it to the front page of the New York Times as computers now are able to caption images, you know, describe what they see in images. It's very impressive, okay? And um, we get headlines that Google's AI can now caption images almost as well as humans. I'll give some caveats on that in a little while. Microsoft, you can try this yourself. Microsoft puts out a caption, what it calls a caption bot. Here's, you can just go to captionbot.ai. You can upload a photograph. And in fact, Microsoft's website its caption bot set, claims that it can understand the content of any photograph and try to describe it as well as any humans. I gave it this photograph and it says, I think it's a group of people on a court with a racket. Okay, pretty good. But can it really understand the content in the way that we can? Um, I think somebody's mentioned uh, neural machine translation earlier, uh, where the idea is that um, 
you take a phrase in one language and encode it, it using a recurrent neural network into um, a, set of, a, a vector of activations and then send those activations to a decoder network, which then decodes it into a target language. Um, this is uh, trained, again, on millions and millions of pairs of phrases from uh, different languages. And when tested against um, human translations, so evaluated, uh, the scores ranging from zero to six, where six is like a perfect translation. So some evaluator looked at uh, translation done by a human and done by the Google Neural Machine Translation, and you can ignore the other part of it, um, the scores were pretty close. These are on sentences from these different language pairs. And here's more understanding talk. What we believe, so Alan Packer from Facebook says what we believe is that the neural networks are learning the underlying semantic meaning of the language. So that's another, you know, people start talking about these semantics, meaning, understanding, et cetera. And in fact, the idea that um, meaning is captured by a, a vector of neural network activations in a high dimensional space is really the core of the d uh, deep learning. That's the idea. And Jeffrey Hinton says, I think you can capture thought by a vector. And they even have something called thought vectors. And that's really summarizes sort of the philosophy of, to me, this summarizes the philosophy of deep learning's um, approach to meaning. And um, just as a one more example, um, in uh, question answering, this is another big area. There's something called the Stanford Question Answering Dataset where they take paragraphs like this from Wikipedia. You don't have to read the whole thing, but, and then there's a question. What is the name of the quarterback who was 38 in Super Bowl 33? Um, and the, uh, um, the task is to locate the answer in the paragraph. Okay, so this has uh, become a very standard benchmark for question answering. It's the best uh, machines to, that do this are deep neural networks. And in fact, if you look at the leaderboard, and these are measures of performance, so higher is better. This is human performance, where they actually asked people on Amazon's Mechanical Turk uh, service to answer these questions, and then they got these different uh, machines to do it. And of course, now Google Brain's machine and now many other machines have uh, surpassed humans on this task. And Microsoft, for instance, uh, put out a press release saying it created an AI that can read a document and answer questions about it as well as a person. So um, I put read a document in red because I'm a little wary of using the term read, which uh, again has the um, association with understanding what you read. Um, but that's what their claim is. And um, Alibaba, a big tech company in China, uh, their chief scientist said that it's our great honor to witness the milestone where machines surpass humans in reading comprehension. Okay, so these are all the claims. Uh, a couple more, one more example. Uh, we, heard, we heard from another speaker about um, uh, DeepMind's um, deep reinforcement learning project on Atari video games uh, where this game breakout where the goal is to move this paddle down here, this purple thing, and here it, it, it hits a ball, which then hits bricks, which then explode, and you get points and so on. And Google um, DeepMind's deep Q learning, oops, I'm going the wrong way, sorry, um, t d ran, uh, developed by deep reinforcement learning, they developed uh, players for a whole suite of Atari games. And up here, you can't really see it, this is how much better than the human tester the, the machine did. So Breakout, their machine did a thousand, like 1,300% better than the human. So that's comparing the score. And this, like, they published this paper in 2015, and 
The same year, Google purchased this company for um, more than half a billion dollars. Based on essentially these results, because it was learning basically from pixels, learned how to play these games, um, and presumably even learned these amazing strategies. I don't, I, we saw, some of you saw the talk where um, it learned how to tunnel through the side of the, um, the um, bricks and then the ball just would bounce back and forth, taking out the most valuable bricks at the top. Okay, and Go, we, we saw um, DeepMind um, beat the best world Go players um, with their AlphaGo system. Uh, and a lot of people talked about how AlphaGo has a very deep understanding of the game. They were, this is a Go champion who was um, very impressed by that. And Demis Hasebis, the co-founder of DeepMind, talks about how the neural networks that uh, learned to play Go captured kind of an int the intuition of the top Go players. So these words all mean something to us. You know, when we talk about them in terms of when humans understand things, when humans have intuitions. So I guess my question was, is the same kind of thing really going on with these machines? Well, um, <laughs> as you, so AI Winter, this is a blog post from, from um, last year by um, an AI researcher who's a little skeptical of all of this. And he said that AI Winter is well on its way. AI Winter is the, uh, re, uh, kind of a cycle, uh, recurring cycle in AI where uh, the claims about how advanced and how close to human level these systems are get really out of proportion to what the systems can actually do. And then expectations aren't met, people are disappointed, and funding dries up. This happened, like, I, I read you those quotes from the 1960s. Well, very shortly after people made those predictions, um, oh, AI winter set in because the predictions really were not um, in, in, uh, panning out the way people had hoped they were. And some people now, including um, this fellow, is predicting that the same thing is happening here. And so this is um, because of when people start looking into these systems in more, much more detail, they find that they have a lot of weaknesses and vulnerabilities. So I'm gonna talk about some of these vulnerabilities. The first one is the fact that these systems, even though they're extremely good, they turn out to be somewhat unreliable. So here's an example. Um, this was a little story I made up this, this, uh, to give to Google Translate. Um, it says, John was displeased with his food and stormed out of the restaurant without paying. The waitress yelled after him, hey, what about the bill? She shrugged her shoulders and went back inside. Okay, so um, here's the translation from uh, English to French. And anyone here speak French? So <laughs> what does this mean? Le projet de loi. <laughs> Right, the, the legislative project, right, which is a bill, right, like a legislative bill. So it's misinterpreting this word, bill. Um, you know, you, Google Translate doesn't, they translate sentence by sentence, so it doesn't always take into account the context. So this is the kind of, you know, it's a really good translation ex in many ways, except it has these little wrong notes in it that really show to me that it's not, it doesn't have the kind of understanding of language that is claimed for it, at least the understanding that we would call human-like understanding. This image captioning can be also be unreliable. This one's a really cute one, but, um, <laughs> you know, it, it also gets like, it, it's sort of claiming that man's a teddy bear, okay. Uh, this one really got me because, um, you know, a horse could be standing in the middle of that road. It looks like the kind of road that a horse could be standing in the middle of, you know, but um, it's not. So it's somehow, f it's, it's taking some features of these images and 
you know, we don't really know exactly how it's working, but, but it's not understanding what's going on in these images. And, you know, companies like Facebook uh, have said, oh, well, now we have systems that can do image captioning. We can provide descriptions of images to, the, to blind people. But it, really, these captioning systems aren't quite at the level yet. They don't understand enough about what, how to interpret an image. This was one that I did on CaptionBot. This is not something you'd want your self-driving car to, um, to think. OK. So we also know that, you know, as much that these systems are trained with millions and millions of examples. And autonomous cars are trained with uh, video and so on. But there's this notion of edge cases, which are things that are unlikely to happen, that hardly ever happen. So, for exa example, this was a tweet someone put out about how the, in, there was a storm coming in the northeast and salt lines were laid out on the road. Um, I don't know if you guys ever encountered this. I went to college in the northeast. There's a lot of snow. <laughs> if you're from California, like the Tesla engineers are from California, you might not have thought of something like this, but it was confusing the Tesla autopilot because it couldn't figure out where the lanes were. Um, so that just hadn't, you know, hadn't been something that had been trained on. Um, there, you know, you've probably seen the bad crashes that the Teslas get into. I, I don't mean to pick on Tesla because other companies have had similar problems, but um, you know, there was a fire truck stopped in the middle uh, on the highway, and the Tesla crashed right into it because it could. It, it was like not a case that it could personally deal with. Of course, they tell you to the, the driver to keep their keep paying attention and put their hands on the, keep their hands on the steering wheel, but people just don't. So um, edge cases are really are, are, are hard for um, supervised learning because they don't occur in the data very much. But humans are able to deal with them better because we have some ability to sort of transfer what we have learned to new situations to adapt our knowledge. Okay, Chitendra Malik, maybe some of you know him, he's here. He said, knowing what I know about computer vision, I wouldn't take my hands off the steering wheel. He's a computer vision expert, by the way. <laughs> um, the deep learning revolution also has some problems with generalization, abstraction, and what machine learning people call transfer learning. Okay, So here's one example. Um, object recognition, we saw that computers have learned, you know, with that ImageNet data set, they've gotten better than humans, you know, at object recognition. But somebody said, okay, well, those objects, that, those pictures in ImageNet were all downloaded from the web. Just, if something's trained on images that are downloaded from the web, how will it transfer to the same objects, but ones that were kind of just taken around the house? Like this robot, they put a camera on this robot, and the, camera, the robot just wandered around taking pictures of stuff. So, you know, pictures that are posted on the web might have certain biases as to, like, the lighting or the pose of the objects or the clutter and so on in the background. So they said, okay, like in a more realistic household setting. Um, and so the, the, their, um, there were two data sets they looked at sort of related to ImageNet. These two rod and wad were two uh, web object data sets. And this ARID was this autonomous robot indoor data set taken by this. So um, I'm just going to focus on these two results. Um, if, you train on, if you train a network on one data set and test it on images from that same data set, um, from the test set, it does quite well. These are different neural network architectures. So it's getting like in the 80% accuracy. But if you take that same network that's trained on the web data set and trained it on this robot data set, its performance crashes. So somehow, even though it's able to recognize, say, you know, microwave oven with, you know, 90% accuracy when they're web images, if they're images that are taken in a very different context from web images, it's not able to generalize. So there's a, a big, um, here's another example where Somebody tried, you know, fire truck, 99% accuracy, but then if you Photoshop it and make it, f put it in different uh, uh, orientations, 
The network's still quite sure it's, some, it's, it, it's something, but it's not a fire truck now. It's something else. So the networks are what we might call brittle. They work really well in the um, domains in which they've been trained, the particular kinds of training sets they've been trained on. But when you start to vary um, things a little bit, they tend to break down. So there, there's an important area now of machine learning called transfer learning which says, how do we get machines to take what they learned and transfer them to related um, domains? So, but to my mind, that's, you know, in human, in human speak, transfer learning is, we call it learning, right? <laughs> learning is when you learn something, you're able to apply it to something that's a little different. Here's something that you might surprise you if you haven't already seen it. Um, remember that breakout game so um, if you uh, train a, neur a neural network, a deep reinforcement learning system to play breakout till it is better than human level, and then you, take, you move the, um, uh, the paddle up two pixels, and you apply this, the, the network that you've trained, it no longer can play the game. This was an experiment done by um, uh, a, a group in 2017, and they showed that the standard Q learning system that was trained on standard breakout was not able to transfer what it learned to even this very simple modification of the game. So when we say that, when we, when we humans talk about what these systems have learned, we tend to anthropomorphize somewhat. We say, oh, it learned to move the paddle so to hit the ball so that it tunnels through the side and knocks out the bricks. But that's assuming that the system learned the concept of paddle and ball and tunnel and brick. Whereas actually it seems like it's not really learning those particular, those same concepts that we learn. So I guess the message of all of this is that when we train neural networks or any kind of machine learning system, it learns something, but what we think it learned might not really be what it actually learned. It might not learn the same thing that we wanted it to learn. And that's one of the reasons that these systems tend to be brittle when we give them new things that we think are the same task, but they don't think it is. Um, these systems also have trouble with abstraction. Um, here's a little task that, um, here's uh, two examples from class one and two examples from class two. Now, what's the difference between the examples in class one and the examples in class two? The difference in separation. Right, so they're identical. I think the, the intention was they're identical. These objects are identical, whereas these objects are not identical. Okay, so humans can do this with just a few examples. But somebody tried to train a network to do this, a, a deep neural network, giving 20,000 examples from each class. They were able to generate these automatically. And then tested on 10,000 new examples. And the time they wrote this paper, these were two of the better um, deep learning methods, and each of them got about chance, they guessing, right? Because you give them a new image, you say, is this class one or is it class two? And they only got about 50% accuracy, whereas humans got, the humans on Mechanical Turk that were tested got about 98% accuracy. Okay, um, so um, one of the things that got me interested in AI in the first place, I, I read Doug Hofstetter's book, Gödel Escher Bach, which probably some of you have read, and he talked about these so-called Bongard problems, which are similar to what I just showed you, where um, uh, you have six examples. Bongard, by the way, was a Russian computer scientist who, who published a, a book called Pattern Recognition in the 60s. Um, he had a, a kind of neural network-like architecture that he was proposing, but he also had a, ch a challenge set of 100 problems, where each problem consists of six boxes from class one and six boxes from class two. And the task is to articulate what the difference is. Um, and they're quite challenging. I mean, 
you probably can sort of, you, you probably can see what, anybody have an idea what the difference between class one here and class two here is? Yeah, they're constricted in the middle. They have sort of what you might call a neck. So there's some like concept that we're applying, we, we can sort of recognize here that's not here. And there, all these problems are quite abstract in some ways. So the, the, just a few other examples. This one I like, what's the difference between here between class one and class two? Three versus four, you get it really fast. And yet, you know, these are completely different objects. So uh, Bongard proposed this as a, as a test for sort of AI um, abstraction back in 1967, and I think we're, we're still almost as far from having a machine that can solve this task now as we were then. Um, my own work, um, let's see if I have time to tell you a little bit about it. I'm interested in, in the task of abstraction and analogy between situations in visual uh, data. So here's a kind of situation, you know, walking a dog, we all, um, can recognize that. Actually, it's, it's often, it's not always easy for a neural network to recognize these situations. But we also get, you know, we can extend our concepts to new kinds of examples, like we can uh, describe this as walking a dog. Um, uh, these people are running, they're not walking, but we, we can perceive it as some, the same kind of concept. Here's somebody walking a cat. <laughs> Here's a, another one where um, uh, it comes with its own leash. It's great. Um, and, you know, we, we see all these different uh, examples of um, different ways in which this concept can be instantiated. So this is just, you know, I do this as kind of a fun example. But... Um, <laughs> We, we humans are extremely flexible about applying our concepts in new situations. And to me, that's what understanding a concept is all about. But we're very far from getting computers to be able to do this. And that, that, that I just wanted to mention that, that that kind of thing is what my current research is on. And Hofstadter, in a later book with, it, with um, Emmanuel Sande, said, without concepts, there can be no thought, and without analogies, there can be no concepts. So this idea of um, analogies as the, the sort of core ability underlying concepts themselves is something that um, I see in all of these uh, kinds of examples. Okay, let me tell, talk a little bit uh, about common sense, since that's now a big kind of buzzword in AI. Um, so, how many people here have heard of the Winograd schemas? A couple people. Okay, so Terry Winograd, a Stanford professor, came up with this idea. Um, so here's uh, two sentences. I poured water from the bottle into the cup until it was full. What was full? Well, uh, obviously the cup. I poured water from the bottle into the cup until it was empty. What was empty? So you change one word and the meaning or the reference of the word it changes. And this was proposed as a challenge for AI, kind of an alternate Turing test that required machines to have the kinds of common sense that we would consider to be important for understanding language, let's say. Here's another one. The steel ball hit the glass table and it shattered. Or the glass ball hit the steel table and it shattered. So what shattered? Okay, so there's an annual challenge for programs that can solve um, Winograd schemas. And the state-of-the-art AI is now about, you know, 50% would be random guessing. State-of-the-art AI is about 60%. Um, humans, I said, I don't know, nobody's tested this on humans, but I would say 100% if people are paying attention. Um, so how does a state-of-the-art AI work? Well, it uses what's called a, a language model, but rather than go into the technical details of that, um, I'll just sort of explain it in terms of that you might, uh, an experiment you might be able to do yourself. Suppose you um, type into Google, the steel ball hit the glass table and the steel ball shattered. 
and count how many hits that sentence gets on Google. And then you do the other uh, word, the steel ball hit the glass table and the glass table shattered. You count how many hits that got on Google. You pick the, the answer that got the most hits. That's essentially what a language model does. And that gets about 60% right, uh, interestingly. Sometimes even more. Um, so Ornazioni um, said that when AI can't determine what it refers to in a sentence, it's hard to believe it will take over the world. <laughs> OK. So um, the, last thing, the last problem that shows kind of a lack of understanding in these systems is the vulnerability to adversarial attacks. And I, um, people have talked about this in previous talks here. Um, you probably, many of you have seen the, this kind of example where you can take a picture, a photo that a neural network can identify correctly with 99% probability or confidence. You can add some noise to it, and this, this noise is, is much magnified. The noise, when you add it to the, the picture, actually doesn't change the picture to humans. It's such a small amount of noise that it looks exactly the same to us. The noise, however, is cleverly engineered to cause the neural network to be 99% sure that this is an ostrich <laughs> for all of these. So all of these, you can engineer no very subtle noise that humans can't see any difference at all so that the network thinks that um, it's an ostrich. An ostrich isn't the only thing. You can take any concept that it, it, it knows about, it, that it can recognize, and target that if you're an adversary and, and make the network think that that's what it's seeing. So that, to me, and by the way, this was uh, pu published in 2013 uh, by a group from Google, and they called their paper Intriguing Properties of Neural Networks. <laughs> <laughs> which is a little bit of a kind of an understatement, I think. It, it's pretty disturbing if you want to think that neural networks are actually seeing something in the image that's similar to what we're seeing. Clearly they're not, uh, because we see a school bus here, we see a school bus here, it sees a school bus here, it sees an ostrich here. What is going on? What is it seeing? This is something that a lot of people are now trying to investigate. Why does this happen? And there's not a general agreement on what, what causes this sort of ability to fool these networks. Um, there's a, let me skip this. Let me tell, uh, so another, uh, some people said, well, that's, you know, you can do that to images. It's, you know, you can, you can manipulate images. It's not very realistic in the real world. But a group at Carnegie Mellon came up with these um, adversarial eyeglass frames that were actually, they, they designed the pattern, they 3D printed these, and they showed that they could use them to fool a face recognition system. So um, they could target, for instance, the, set, the system had been um, trained on celebrity faces and was really good at recognizing celebrities, oops, like um, Mila Jovovich, but the system now was, not, when seeing this, with this, this, this is one of the researchers wearing the glasses, um, that it was 99% sure that this was Mila jo Jovovich. So it's, the, the, the moral of the story is it's easy to fool these systems because they don't see what we see. They're not basing their classifications on the same thing we are. They're not understanding the data in the same way we understand. And this has been shown in almost every domain of deep learning and other machine learning methods, including medical images. You can like change uh, a, a normal lung x-ray and make, and make it completely look the same to humans, but now a diagnostic AI system is 100% sure this has some uh, kind, kind of lung disease. And um, you can do that with dermat derm dermatolo dermatological images. It, you can do it with... Um, autonomous car vision systems. People uh, put, some people here at Berkeley, uh, computer science department, put st stick little stickers on stop signs, adversarial stickers that made the system, uh, the computer vision system, um, recognize them as speed limit 80 signs. <laughs> and 
this was showing the accuracy, the, the, the top class that the, from all these different angles and, and uh, distances from, uh, from the stop sign, it was pretty robust in being pretty sure it was a speed limit 80 sign. So that's a little bit scary. Um, you can do this with voice um, speech recognition. It's been shown that you can take uh, something that sounds to us like um, white noise, but sounds to the, um, your Alexa system as something like, okay, Google browse to evil.com or whatever targeted uh, sentence you want, they, the, the adversary wants your Alexa or whatever to hear. Okay, and even these question answering systems, the ones that you know, have, were described as abstracting the semantic meaning of the language, you can add adversarial sentences to these questions, this one in blue, and make the network that has been trained to do better than human performance on um, these question answering systems give the wrong answer. So, in general, these are uh, very, um, they, that they show that these systems, these uh, uh, deep learning systems are very, very good in most cases, but they're brittle when the data changes a little bit from what they've been trained on, and they're also vulnerable to, um, to attack, these kinds of attacks. And so the question is, to me, to, in order to be reliable and robust in the domains we want them to work in, do they need human-like understanding? They clearly don't have it, but do they need it, or do they just need more data and more layers, network layers? And if they do need understanding, what, is it, what kind of understanding do they need? So in the last five minutes, okay, <laughs> I'll talk about understanding. Okay, so one of my favorite blog posts was from um, Andre Karpathy, who's now the head of AI at Tesla. But this was back when he was a grad student at Stanford. He wrote this post um, where he took this, this photograph that um, came from uh, the official White House photographer in the Obama administration uh, and asked, what would it take to understand this photograph? Okay, and this is just a fantastic example. Um, and his post, I really recommend reading the whole thing because it's really, it's really quite insightful. It talks about, you know, how all the different things that are going on here, you know, from the level of we can recognize that this is a scale just from a few, you know, white pixels that are blending in with the white wall. And we recognize that this is a person in a mirror, not another pers person in the room, right? And we recognize that these people are, um, that it's a locker room, that they're all in suits and that's weird in a locker room, right? And that, um, this guy's weighing himself, and we know that, so it's like going from like basic, you know, low level vision up to uh, sort of our intuitive psychology that we know that, you know, well, we know that how a scale works, we know that people are self conscious about their weight, and we know that's, you know, him putting his foot on the scale will make the weight go up, and that will make him think he's, you know, heavier than he hoped, and then everybody's laughing, but they're not laughing in a mean way. They, it's kind of a prank, and you know, it just goes on and on and on. And um, he says, he concludes from this that the state of computer vision is that we are really, really far away, because to get a system to understand such a photo, um, would involve all of this knowledge and uh, ability to bring together, you know, integrate different levels of knowledge. And some of the things, you know, that are included that, that people in cognitive science talk about that are, are missing from today's AI are things like intuitive physics, intuitive biology, intuitive psychology, you know, the things that we know about the real world, causal models, these neural networks that I have mentioned that do so well don't have any uh, model of causality. Uh, they don't have, um, I won't go into this kind of stuff, they aren't able to do the kind of abstraction and analogy that I've talked about. Um, they don't have the kind of active social learning that babies engage in. And if you give this image to say the caption bot, which says it can understand the content of any photograph, here's what it thinks is going on. I think it's a group of people standing in a room. And you can't argue with that, right? Um, but that's, and that could be useful, 
but it's missing all of the meaning that is inherent in this image, the meaning that we bring to understanding by virtue of all of our knowledge and our, uh, our um, sort of more ability to use concepts. So um, I got the title of my talk from Giancarlo Rota, who in 1985 said, I wonder whether and when AI will ever crash the barrier of meaning. And I found that a very kind of compelling way of thinking about the problem, that there's this barrier between sort of general, um, just sort of statistical learning and meaning. And it's really hard to articulate what that barrier consists of, but I think some of the things that I've listed are at least part of the, the, what we think of when we think about meaning. And um, right now, there's a lot of, work, a lot of um, money and effort going into these things like teaching computers common sense. Paul Allen, who died uh, last year, before he died, he, he invested a lot of money in uh, his inst AI institute. And DARPA, who's the biggest funding, funder of um, AI in um, the US, has a big new program called Machine Common Sense, where they see that that's really what we have to focus on. And what they mean by common sense is really all of these things that I've been talking about. So I didn't answer the question of uh, when will AI crash the barrier of meaning or what meaning is, but I hope I gave you some um, idea about the state of the art of AI and what its relationship is to understanding and in, in that it can be unreliable and vulnerable due to its lack. Um, and then there's a big question of what's required to um, cross this barrier and whether it will require embodiment or human-like developmental learning. So I talk about, oh, and I was going to say that um, just a quick quotation that, that I liked um, that um, says that the ideas like believe, know, mean, these words that I've been using, self and understand, like from our previous discussion, um, that they're pre-scientific. You may or may not agree. Um, technically, this was, by the way, said by Marvin Minsky in 1980. Technically too coarse to support powerful theories. Our confusions about these notions, he said, stem from a burden of traditional ideas inadequate to this tr tremendously difficult enterprise. And this is still a formative period for ideas about mind. And I think that goes along with what Bruno Olshausen said where, when he said that what we need, we need a new kind of mathematics that we don't have yet. And so we use these words like the, as placeholders, these words like self or understand or mean. And they really are um, placeholders for more, um, more theories that more explanatory theories. So I tried to bring all of these ideas together in my new book, which I'm giving a shameless plug for here, uh, which is coming out this fall. And I'm happy to answer any questions. <laughs>